Genesis. Um, I like old Tom Malone. He was such a great preacher. And he always said, when you preach, he said, he's told the young preachers, he said, read a lot of scripture. And he said, that way if you get persecuted in one verse, you can flee to the next one. And I, I've, I've been persecuted many times in verses, and I, I understand what he meant. But uh, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 6 with me, and um, look down about verse 6. Genesis 6, verse 6, maybe they'll have it on the screen up there. But uh, it says, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy to us, and thank You that we have freedom in America to worship You, that we have this place to come. And God, we thank You for the way we've been blessed already with the music and the fellowship with Your people. But Lord, we certainly need Your help, because uh, if You are not involved in what we're trying to do, and uh, then it's all wood, hay, and stubble. And so I pray that uh, you'll speak to our hearts this morning, that we will honor you and understand you a little bit better. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. You know, uh, I want to talk to you about the heart of God. Because if you'll notice in that verse, it said, first of all, that it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth and grieved him at his heart. And that is an interesting statement. Um, What it is, is it's taking a human attribute and applying it to God. God is not physical, as you and I, but uh, the Bible uses these attributes, human attributes, so that we can understand God a little bit better. Otherwise, you know, we communicate through words, and words form pictures in our mind, And uh, so by understanding the words, we understand that's how we communicate. And uh, so when God talks about being grieved in His heart, you can understand that. You've been grieved yourself. And you know what it is to to grieve and to be sorrowful in your heart. And so uh, I can understand that. It helps me to understand God, that God has emotion as I have. And, uh, you know, God can, God can be pleased. God can rejoice. God can be angry. God can be uh, made, uh, made to feel sad. And uh, here the, uh, uh, it says that it, that actually it says it grieved the heart of the Lord. And uh, he repented. That is, he, he was uh, sorry in his feelings that he had made man. Uh, You know, when he made man in Genesis, it says, And God saw it was good, and everything that he had made was good. But sin entered in and marred the picture and dirtied uh, the work of God. And men immediately were corrupt. If you remember the the first boy ever born murdered his own brother. So sin came into the world full grown. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not very long, not many years later, till the whole earth had corrupted itself. And every thought of man was just, was just on evil and wickedness. And so God sees this. And he, he, he repented. He, he was sorry that he'd even made man. And he was grieved in his heart. And uh, I think by giving us that term... Uh, we can understand a little bit about our own behavior and how it must grieve God because I can grieve God uh, in, in His heart when I don't do right. And uh, God, uh, you know, God changes His ways toward men. He changes His thoughts toward them. Uh, God never changes. God is always the same. But that doesn't mean that God always does things the same. It doesn't mean that God always thinks the same thing. Uh, He changes His attitude. He changes His ways. But His attributes never change. God is always the same. He's always holy. He's always righteous. 
He's always uh, just. He's always truthful. But, uh, but you, can, uh, you can certainly change how God feels about you, and uh, you can change His heart. Uh, he has emotions. He has feeling, just as you do. And that's important to remember. Uh, in Ephesians, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. I think they'll put it on the text of the screen there. But Paul said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You have the Holy Spirit living in you if you're a Christian, and you can grieve Him. And once you do that, He has to start ministering to you rather than through you. And He no longer works through you, but He has to work on your own heart and your own life to try to bring you back into a, back into a right relationship. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, it says, And when he, Jesus, had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand, and so on. When the Lord Jesus looked around and saw all the unbelief, it not only upset him, but it aggrieved him. Do you know the, the, the worst insult somebody could give to you is that they don't believe you? What if every time you said something, somebody says, I just don't believe you. I don't trust you. And that's the worst insult you could get. Because truthfulness uh, has to do with your character of who you are. And that's why your name is more important than silver or gold. Because your word is what you are. Many, many years ago, people could just give their word that they would pay their bill or they would do such and such. And it was a settled matter. But now you have to sign a ream of paper in blood. Why? Because nobody believes anybody. And that unbelief, it's easy. Once you lose, you know, you lose confidence and, and uh, display a lack, of, uh, a lack of trust, it really makes it difficult for people to believe God. And uh, so Jesus looked around on his own nation and looked around on these people who didn't believe him. And, and he was angry and grieved. And, uh, you know, and so we can understand that God can be grieved by our behavior. You know, there are children that grow up that really, they try to please their parents. And they try to do right. And there are some kids that the only reason they don't do wrong is they don't want to, dis they don't want to disappoint their parents. I've had kids to tell me, they say, you know, I just don't want to disappoint my mom and dad. Well, praise God for that group. You see, regardless of what your motive is, you ought to do right. But I, you've got you've to have some kind of respect for a young man or a young woman who says, you know what, I don't want to disappoint my father. I don't want to disappoint my mother. I don't want to grieve them. And I know that my behavior would. And, uh, and so uh, you can grieve God. He can be grieved in his heart, especially when you don't believe him. Because you're, you know, think about what you're saying about him. You see, I know there's, I know that, you know, for every dollar, there's a counterfeit dollar. And that really shows that it's valuable if people, if it wasn't any value, people wouldn't counterfeit it. And I know for every professing Christian, there's probably 10 counterfeits. But you should not blame God for what other people do. And sometimes it's only an excuse to not live right when we see other people being hypocritical. But, you know, you don't have to do wrong because everybody else does. It, first of all, it's wrong, but secondly, it grieves God at His heart. Not only that, I can please God. Look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Genesis 8, 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and uh, the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything that liveth as I have done. So here you can see uh, an attribute of God is that he can be pleased. And he, there are things that he can enjoy. And uh, Noah demonstrated that in the fact that he, that he offered an offering that was pleasing to God. And we please God when we worship Him. 
uh, because God is worthy of our worship, and, uh, and He demands it. And God had a place where the offering was brought there in the Old Testament, and He had an intent for it. It says, Noah built an altar, and He offered on the altar the, uh, the clean animals that He had brought uh, with Him. And uh, so God has a place. Of course we can worship God anywhere. You can worship God on a mountain, on a lake, or anywhere else. Of course you can do that. And you should. But God has de uh, de designated all through the Old Testament and the New, and in the millennium to come, a place where God's people ought to assemble to worship Him. And uh, today that place is the church. That is God's plan. Now, the wonderful thing about worship is it doesn't matter what size the church is. A church can be 15 or 20 people or it can be 15,000 people. Because worship is something that people can do not only individually but collectively. So uh, that's why we come together and we sing songs of praise to God. And uh, we thank Him and we read Scripture together. And we give our offerings together. And we do these things as a means of worshiping God. It's a way of showing our respect for Him and our love for Him. Uh, that's the way we do it. We show that we should do that collectively as well as, you know, when you're alone, you ought to have a time of prayer and you ought to have a time of praising God. I mean, that's right. But you should not do that at the exclusion of the place that God has in mind for His people. The Lord started the local church. And that is His plan that God's people come together and worship Him. And uh, they should do it in the beauty of holiness as uh, Brother Mark led us in that text this morning. Also it pleases God when we sacrifice to Him. It pleases God when we do that. Uh, it is he is worthy of our, uh, of our sacrifice and uh, His praise. There in chapter 6, if you look at uh, verse 20, it said, "...of fowls after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing uh, on the earth after its kind, two of every sort shall there come unto thee uh, to keep them alive." And uh, God told Noah not only to bring two of everything, but He also was to bring an extra animals that are called clean animals. And uh, those are designated, of course, throughout the Scriptures of, uh, of uh, something clean, designated clean, that was to be offered to God. I want you to look at uh, Romans chapter 12. They're going to put it on the screen here. But look at uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Romans 12, 1. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... A living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, a man brought uh, whatever was designated. Could have been an animal, and uh, but today you're to bring yourself, and you are to sacrifice yourself for the cause of Christ. Um, your body should be a living sacrifice, and that means that you give it to the Lord. You don't, uh, you know, you don't live for the devil. You don't live for the purpose of the flesh. You let God use your body. I, I don't know. Folks need to understand the Lord on this earth has no eyes but yours, no ears but yours, no feet but yours. He's not going to build a bus route. He's not going to direct the choir. He's not going to sing the specials. He's not going to run the sound equipment. He's not going to work in the nursery. God, you are His body on this earth. You're His hands and His feet. I used to have a, a family came to this church uh, many, many years ago. Uh, he was in the deaf ministry. Some of you will remember him. I think his name was Bill. Was that right? First name was Bill. And, uh, you know, he worked for the post office. And really he was a brilliant man. But he had a, a muscular disease. And his face was always distorted, and his fingers were gnarled, and, and he, he could barely walk. He walked like a monster when he walked. And I think people probably feared him, and they got away from him. 
But the truth is, this man was honored by President Reagan and invited to meet with him. And I, I remember how frustrated he would get. He would try to mouth something, but his mouth wouldn't work. And he'd try to sign, but his fingers wouldn't work. And his mind was clear. He understood exactly what he was trying to do, but his body wouldn't cooperate. How frustrating that must be. And yet, you and I are the body of Christ on this earth. He is the head. And the head is clear exactly on what he wants done. But we, many times, are like this. And we have things coming out of our mouth that uh, ought not to be coming out. And the hands are doing things that they ought not to be doing. And, and we get angry. We're frustrated. And I don't know if God is, is that frustrated or not. But you and I are His body. And we can grieve Him. And we can please Him. And, uh, you know, I, I get... You know, I, I think a lot of folks have this attitude, you know... You know, before you get old, you ought to sow your wild oats and then pray for crop failure. But I assure you, there won't be a crop failure. Right. You sow wild oats, that's what you're going to get back, a whole harvest. Right. I find that people that are probably over 40 are trying to undo all of the mistakes and the wrong they did back there, and you can't undo it. Right. You know, it's like a backlash on a fishing reel. I mean, it takes too long to untangle it. And what you do is you just get the fingernail clippers out and you cut it and you rehook it. But the thing, you've lost hundreds of feet of fishing line. And you, you know, the damage that you do to your life and to your body. I mean, we all spend time after 40 saying, I wish I hadn't have done that. See? And I see guys, you know, that they, they love God, but, you know, really they've got brain damage. They had drugs and all kinds of chemicals put in their body and they thought they could do it without, um, without consequences. And you can't. I just talked to someone the other day. Matter of fact, somebody used to come to this church. And I can be bribed if you want to know who it is. And I could lie, you wouldn't know. <laughs> he told me, he said, I've just, I just returned from the third time with this particular family member on, at uh, detox or drug rehab. Third time around. I know people that have been three times and four times and five times and ten times and fifteen times around. And they do it again. I'll guarantee you they wish they'd have never smoked the first one or shot the first one or drank that first one. Because nobody takes one of those and looks down the road and says, I want to become an addict. I want to ruin my life. I want to destroy my body. Now really what you want is you think you can be happy. You think you'll be happier if you do that. You think you know better than God. If I do this, I'll be happy. I'll be accepted. See, because that's what you want. But you find out that uh, when it's all over with, you're, you're ruined. God needs your body while you're young. You ought to give it to Him while you're young and let Him use it. Become a Sunday school teacher or a youth worker or work in the nursery or run a bus route or do something for the glory of God. You're bought with a price. You're not your own, the Bible says. And so you ought to glorify Him. And so we please God. I don't think this really happened, but it, it's a good illustration. Preacher got through preaching saying you ought to give your body to the Lord. At the end of the service, they took the offering. About halfway through the auditorium, they noticed some commotion. A little boy about four-year-old was standing in the offering plate. The usher said, what are you doing? He said, I'm giving myself to Jesus. Well, I don't think that happened, but I think, you know, it's, it's a good story. And that's what you ought to do. You ought to put yourself in the offering plate. You ought to put yourself on the altar. 
And you want to please God? I mean, you want your kids to please you. That's the desire of your heart, is that they turn out well and do well, and that would please you. A fellow told me just recently, he said, the only time I ever hear, fellow down in Arizona, he said, the only time I ever hear from my grandchildren is when it's their birthday. He said, I never get a phone call from them. I never get a birthday card myself. Never get a thank you note. And he said, I confronted them. And I says, you know what? I don't need anything from you, just some acknowledgement that I exist. And uh, he just told them. Told them outright. You know, he said, you're selfish. The only time you ever call is when you want something. And you know, usually that's the way it is with our prayer life. Lord, I don't need you right now. Everything's going fine. But it isn't a matter of whether you need him or not. You need him every hour you need him. But, you know, wouldn't it be okay if you just said to the Lord, Lord, I don't want anything. I just want to praise you. I don't need anything back. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that I was raised, that, you know, that I came in contact with somebody who was a Christian. I want to thank you for the people you've brought into my life to help me. I want to thank you that you've provided for me. I want to thank you I was born in America, so I had an opportunity to hear the gospel. I want to thank you for my, for my family, for my mother, for my dad, for my children, my grandchildren. I mean, you don't always have to go to God saying, give me. You ought to praise Him and thank Him. And, you know, I can find the heart of God. You know, uh, Saul, Saul was a man who, you know, he was a king outwardly, but he was not, he was a coward inwardly. And, uh, you know, God uh, spoke through Samuel, and here's what he told Saul. But now thy kingdom shall not continue... The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Isn't that something? And the Lord hath commanded him to be the captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So there in 1 Samuel, you need not turn there, but 1 Samuel chapter 13. Um, God said, I'm going to take the kingdom away from Saul. I've found a man after my heart. And I'm going to tell you what. If you will seek the heart of God, God will find you. He'll find you. And you know that's what you want in a relationship. You want the heart of the other person. You want their heart. And a lot of folks know in a marriage they've got a partner, but they don't have, a, they don't have their heart. And God said, I found somebody. I found a man. And that's... Here Saul is the king, but he doesn't have the heart of a king. He doesn't have the heart for God. And, uh, and uh, I think the same thing is true. You know, David was not a king, but he had, a, he had the heart for God. Saul had the position, and David had the heart. And God looked for a man and found him, said he sought for a man, the man who sought uh, uh, his heart. And that means you're trying to get close to God, trying to know Him. You know, many of you in this building this morning, you know me in the pulpit, you know me at the door, but you don't know me. And I know you when I see your faces, and I know you at the door, but I don't know you. But there are some of you I do. There are some of you that I've been able to spend time with, a lot of time with, and I think I know your heart. I think I know this guy's heart. I think I know his wife's heart. I think they have a heart to serve God. And they have a heart for this church. And God is looking for people like that, that have a heart for it. You know how it is. A lot of people at work, they're there physically, but they're just not there. They could care less about the company or anything. They're just there to get their check. And God, you know, there are a lot of people in church that way. If you ask them why they're there, they're not even sure why they're there. But God is looking for people who will look for His heart, and it can be found. Did you know the Bible said, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you? 
God will be to you exactly what you are to Him. If you want Him, you can find Him. Fourthly, God has a heart that will be fulfilled. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41, Yea, I will rejoice over them. That's over Israel, the nation. I will rejoice over them and to do them good. Watch this. I will plant them in this land and assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. I am to love God with all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, all of that. So here God uses that term. He said, I will bless them with Israel with my whole heart and my soul. That's your whole being. And God couldn't, uh, couldn't illustrate it any better than that. So really what he's saying here is I'll regather Israel, the nation of Israel. God said, I will regather them into my land. Now, only 50 years ago, Israel became a land for the Jews. For 2,000 years, they were without a land. And God said, I will plant them back in their land. So regardless of what you think, 50 years ago, the land was given to Israel. Israel has been settled there and occupying it. And they are going to occupy it in peace, according to Scripture. But God said, I will regather them. I want you to uh, go to the book of Ezekiel with me. Oh, they'll put it on the screen up there. Um, chapter 32. Chapter 32. And uh, verse 41, I believe it is. No, it's, uh, it's chapter 11. We just read that uh, 32. I want you to go to chapter 11 and uh, look down at verse uh, 17. 11.17, therefore, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, watch it, I will even gather you from the people, that is the Gentiles, that the Gentile nations, I will assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Now that is the promise in the Bible for the nation of Israel. They've been scattered for 2,000 years. God said, I'm going to give you that land and I'm going to bring you back out of the Gentile nations. Now what happens is the, Gen the Jews become happy in the Gentile nations. So God has to raise up circumstances to where the Jews are no longer welcome. And like Pharaoh did and others. And uh, I fear that in the very near future that the opinion of the American people against Israel is going to change. Something has to happen in this nation to make the Jews want to go back to that land. Right now the Jews over there would love to come here, many of them. But uh, something is going to happen, popular opinion is going to change, and you know how fickle uh, people are, don't you? I mean, think about it, when, when George Bush became president, he had about a 98% rating. Now he has the lowest possible. It's easy. I mean, we change hot and cold, you know, in two or three years. So the whole opinion about Israel can change. And when it does, we're in trouble. But God says, I'm going to bring them back. Look at verse 18 of uh, chapter 11. And they shall come here, that's Israel, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all of the abominations thereof from there. And I will give them one heart. Now this is when the nation will be converted in the land. And I will put a new spirit within you, that's Israel. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. And I will give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. In other words, God's heart is going to be fulfilled. His plan is going to be accomplished. And uh, He's going to regather Israel and, and He will convert 
the Jewish people to him. Right now, do you know that many, if not most of the Jews are atheists? They really are. Many of them are communist and atheist. And uh, so the time is going to come when their heart is going to change. God will have to work a miracle to make that happen. And then God uh, has a heart that is faithful. Uh, in, in Psalm 33, verse 11, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of His heart to all generations. And so the context here is contrasting the counsel of the world with the counsel of God. The world is fickle. They make all kinds of promises before election day. And as soon as they're elected, they forget them. See? But God doesn't change His promises. And uh, He's going to keep His promise. And uh, God's counsel is right because it comes from the heart of one that is faithful. God's counsel is righteous. Therefore, He must be faithful. And then God's counsel is far-reaching. It's to all men everywhere. God's counsel, that's God's determination. It's His determination. Do you know that God determined, listen carefully, God determined in the Old Testament to get the gospel to the whole world through the nation of Israel. Israel bombed out. When their forerunner came, they cut his head off, John the Baptist. When the Messiah came, they crucified Him on a cross. And when the disciples went out to preach the gospel of the resurrection, they killed all of them. So God started a brand new program with a brand new apostle called the Apostle Paul. God said, I am going to get the gospel to the Gentile world so people will have an opportunity to be saved. My plan is that it will become through Israel. But Israel rejected their Messiah. They didn't know Him. They crucified Him. And God said, I'm still going to get my plan fulfilled. And He raised up the Apostle Paul. And because of that, you are still hearing the Word of God today. But one of the days, these days, the rapture of the church will take place. We sang that song, I'll Fly Away. I kind of like that. It's a little corny, but it's true. We'll fly away when the rapture takes place. And... Uh, and so God has a plan that you hear the gospel and get saved. That is God's plan. That's why we send missionaries around the world, is so people can hear the gospel. And so that is God's plan for you. Now you and I, you know, we grieve the heart of God when we, uh, or we can please Him. You can grieve Him or please Him, whatever you want to do. And uh, because it's your choice. You have a free will, and you can choose to do whatever you want to. God has granted you that, and, uh, but I don't know how you could know Him and not want to please Him. You know, the thing about God is the more you get to know Him, the more you love Him. The more you get to know Him, the more you want to please Him.